which inspires us to love one another. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. With hearts full of generosity and grace. Why do I have to ask for forgiveness if you're not making mistakes? Scripture teaches us the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them. I cherish women. And I will be great on women's health issues. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab them by the My favorite book is the Bible. My second favorite book is The Art of the Deal. But and it's not even close. Actually, I was only kidding. You can get the baby out of here. Two Corinthians, right? Two Corinthians, 317. That's the whole ball game. You can do anything. Grab them by the You can do anything. That's what you said, correct? Well, historically, that's true with stars. Not always, but largely true. Unfortunately or fortunately. I just don't know what to say. I, I guess I will go to 2 Corinthians to find out. Donald Trump's words and actions not exactly lining up with the church's teachings. Let's bring right now Russell Moore. He's the editor-in-chief at Christianity Today and leads its public theology project in these crazy times. Uh, Russ is also the author of the new book, Losing Our Religion, An Altar Call for Evangelical America. And Russ, I just, I just have to go to one of those clips that still eight years later fascinates me, that members of our tribe, I'll just say, I'll just, evangelicals generally, we both grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, but that they would sell their political souls. And I'll just say their political souls. I'll be nice this morning to a guy who says, I don't need to be forgiven for, by God. I don't need to ask God for forgiveness. Anybody that has been in Sunday school for five minutes or whose parents had them go to training union growing up after uh, Sunday night church, our Wednesday supper and then youth. I mean, you name it. You're there for five minutes. You know, we're all sinners and we're all saved by grace. And if you ask, you will receive. And if you don't think you need that grace, just keep walking because that's, that's the first requirement. It's so elemental, Russell. And yet, you and I still have people coming up to us thinking we're heretics because we're not following this guy. Well, that's the, that's the sadness uh, of the entire thing. I think there are a lot of people who would say with the asking for forgiveness, well, we don't necessarily need a Christian uh, president, and of course that's true. But those same people would say we need somebody with character. And then, of course, we've seen everything that we have seen uh, over the past uh, eight or nine years. And I, uh, my big fear is that we're at the point right now where it's not even a point of controversy for most people. Most people who would ordinarily argue about this have either made peace with it or have just stopped talking to people who would disagree with them. And that's one of the reasons why I really don't think 2024 is going to be a repeat of what we saw in 2016 and 2020. It's just numbness. And I think that says yeah. something really bad about American life and about church life, too. You know, it's interesting. We, we, uh, we you and I, again, and I always stumble around when I'm talking about this because it's such a shock to see people that I grew up with. And that I literally was at church with four nights a week. Um, just wander. You know, I, I had I had one of them come up to me when my mom uh, when was at my mom's funeral at First Baptist Church in Pensacola. And my my mom's casket was three feet behind me. <laughs> she came up lecturing me about Donald Trump and saying, how could you as a Christian? I'm praying. And I just cut her off. I said, won't say her name. I said, I want you to know I'm going to pray for you tonight when I go home because you were lost and you need Jesus more than you've ever needed Jesus before in your life. And then I turned around and shook other people's hands. But that's like, that's the cultish level it's gotten to again for people we grew up with. But I, yeah. I want you to give some good news too. you and Beth Moore, not related. You had an event about your book uh, a week or two ago, and you said so many people came up to you, evangelicals came up and go, 
thank goodness you all are here. I thought I was alone. Yeah, I mean, the number one uh, comment that I get is, I thought I was crazy. And I see a lot of that, especially with evangelical women. Uh, there are a lot of evangelical women who are deeply concerned about some of the things that have been uh, passed over and waved away over the past several years, and, and that we keep seeing uh, repeatedly and ongoingly. And it's not just about the Trump phenomenon, it's about other things as well. Uh, but related things, uses of power in horrific ways within the church and outside the church. But there are a lot of people who feel homeless. Uh, they feel as though they don't fit into a neat category when it comes to their political party or their uh, church tradition. I actually think that's a good thing. Uh, I think we've been too closely tied uh, to those uh, identities, and it's kept us from seeing uh, the fact that Christianity really is about being different, about, uh, about walking in step with the kingdom of God, not with any set of uh, party or denominational bosses. And if that's the beginning of something new, then I, I welcome it. Robert Gibbs. Yeah, let me ask you one question. You, you, you talk a little bit here about politics. Who, who do you see on the Republican side or on the Democratic side that evangelicals are interested in uh, in politics? Who, if not in Donald Trump, who in 2024 and beyond do you see uh, as uh, having an entree into these voters? Well, I hear almost no uh, evangelical Christians talking about uh, the primary election yet at all. There'll be talk about uh, people on various sides of the Donald Trump indictments, but I don't hear uh, much talk at all about uh, support for various candidates. I just don't think most of them have have tuned into that yet. Now, that would be different, of course, in Iowa because uh, they're being courted right now, but I don't think that's the case in the rest of the country. Well, that's what I wanted to actually ask you right there was the idea of Iowa, because we know that former Vice President Pence in particular is trying to win over this group of evangelicals. And I think he stands as a fascinating case study. He is someone who is a man of deep faith, uh, who makes it center to his political uh, identity. But yet, by so many diehard Republicans, including evangelicals, is deemed as a traitor because he betrayed Donald Trump uh, instead of, uh, you know, they, because these, these Republicans wanted him to abandon his duty to the Constitution. Yeah, and that, well, that's what was so disturbing to me about watching a film from the Iowa State Fair, people screaming at Vice President Pence, you're not a Christian. I mean, people can have all kinds of views about Mike Pence, but the idea that he's not a Christian is ridiculous. And you ask, uh, why? And it's because he stood up for the Constitution and, and wouldn't uh, undo our entire democracy. Well, if that's the definition of what it means to be a Christian, we're in a very dark place. Um, and so I think uh, I think Mike Pence uh, has a, a lot of work to do, of course, in a Republican primary the way that it is right now. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that he stood by his principles on January the 6th and, and that he's starting to talk about that quite a bit right now. R Russell, let's talk about young Christians. Uh, you know, in 94, when I ran, I noticed uh, when I would go to Christian schools or I would, I would, I would go to churches, younger Christians would, would be like their parents talking about cultural issues, cultural issues that a lot of people are talking about today. Um, I, by 2000, I noticed when they would come into my office in Washington to get jobs, a lot of them were like wearing Birkenstocks. Uh, they were talking about hunger, AIDS in Africa. Uh, they were, the, 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 the emphasis was, and it was such a marked change in six years. It's what I call uh, Matthew 25 Christians. What we know of is Matthew 25 Christians, you know, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, uh, helping the poor, bringing hope to the hopeless. And that was the focus. And there was a real, and a real energy. I remember at Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina, going to Mississippi and Louisiana and not seeing the government over there, there were a lot of young evangelicals that were on the front lines immediately. Um, I wonder, is all of this causing a crisis in faith 
for younger Christians, all of this fighting, this Trumpism, because uh, we're hearing about the emptying out of churches. What's the impact of this on those Christians? Well, even the word evangelical, in, in almost every case, someone who will push back and say, I don't like the word evangelical, let's not use it. That's almost always somebody who is the most committed uh, kind of evangelical, but they see it as being uh, captured by political uh, sorts of connotations that they don't uh, that they don't support. And often the people who will say, yeah, I'm an evangelical, are people who haven't been to church since the first Bush administration, but who identify with the politics. Well, that's not an even trade. And I think right now we have a lot of people who are hurt, uh, who are disillusioned. And, um, and my response to that is to say, let's not pretend that we don't have a crisis. Let's address the crisis, but let's not yield to cynicism. Uh, let's instead create and form something new. And I see a, a lot of signs of life uh, there, but it's going to be a really important next four or five years to see whether or not we get there.